Welcome to the Metal Voice today on the show. I think the first time you've ever even been on this show with Ralph Sheepers. Thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Primal Fear. Good news. Uh, The uh, debut album is coming out as a deluxe edition. The band's 25th anniversary is going to be released July 15, 2022. All right. So right off the bat, we'll get into sort of the history of the album, but what can the people expect just as sort of extra bonuses on this album? Well, first of all, it's remastered from yes. the master Jacob Hansen from from Denmark, and uh, yeah, I mean that's pretty much the candy we have here. Mm-hmm. Just uh, you know, pinching up, uh, pimping up the sound. Okay. <laughs> I know everybody says it's brick walled anyway. We don't need a master, but that's not true. It's um, Jacob is is not brick walling stuff. He's just taking care that it sounds more solid and. Of course, if you have a rudimental sound from the album, you can't change so much. But in the end, the mastering is just, you know, uh, bringing more brilliance to it. And uh, yes, that's that's the major difference. And of course, as a uh, special now, after all those years, re-releasing it with Atomic Fire. So that's the deal behind it. Yeah. And also there's a bonus track of uh, Breaker, right? Oh, yes, that's the Accept uh, cover we did once. Absolutely. Yeah, true. So it's Chain Breaker, Breaker. And of course, running in the dust live, That's right? Coincidence so. with, with breaker breaker. <laughs> there was a breaker theme going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were, we were just covering breaker from the set, and then chain breaker was uh, initially uh, initially on the album anyway. So that was coincidence that that now breaker is on it as well as as a bonus. Yeah, yeah. So l- let's just dive into sort of the importance of this album, right? <clears throat> now, I, I, I guess for the people who don't know you or are going to get to know, or no, kind of know you, but a first time on this show, right? Just quick. I know you've talked about this in all interviews in the beginning, but just a quick overview, right? You know, I guess you came out in a time when metal was starting to start to go down, right? Like it's sort of, uh, you know, with, with uh, g- Gamma Ray, right? Um, tell us about, you know, you're in the band, you're in Gamma Ray with Kai Hansen, of course, from Halloween. He leaves Halloween and you join the band. So tell me about that experience really quickly yes that was that was earlier that was 1986 when we already got in touch i mean we we uh produced a demo together he was producing a band from hamburg and he wanted to have a singer for them and uh so he knew me from time pace back in the day and uh he was still in, in halloween then and he was producing that band mystic Pro, not it's just prophecy prophecy i guess and uh, then we got to know each other more closely in the studio. We worked pretty well together. And a year or two later or so, he I heard that he left Halloween and I just got in touch with him again. And he he said the same thing. He wanted to get in touch with me to, to write some stuff. Mm-hmm. That's what we did. And so uh, Gamma Ray somehow was born. First, the record company uh, wanted to have Kai Hansen's project because they didn't, didn't want to call it uh, Hansen Sheepers. So... They said um, it's Kai Hansen's project, and and then we came at the same time with with Gamma Ray. Kai came up with the name Gamma Ray, so that was the first three albums. Then with with Gamma Ray, but coming back to Primal Fear, that was after the split with Gamma Ray. With that had certain uh, reasons. One of them was, of course, because of my application for Judas Priest, which didn't happen in the end, and everybody's lucky now. So that's all the history behind. I mean, how many times have you said the Judas Priest thing? Ah, uh, a million of times, but you know, it's all fine and, and everybody's happy now because Rob yeah, is back yeah. anyway and, and, and Tim also does a great job. He's a nice guy. We're all friends somehow. Uh, we're buddies. Let, let me ask you, when, when you join yeah. Gamma Ray, and we're going to build up to the, the, the release, we're just getting some background here. You join Gamma Ray. I mean, to me, you, you could do Kiske, you can do Darius, you can do Halford, you can, you're, you're so versatile. Did he Funny tell thing. you, I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah, the funny thing behind all this, I always did somehow without knowing his kid, I sung like I did before. And uh, of course, you can tell that that I was somehow a fan of Judas Priest in the early days. Absolutely. I was 16 years old when Unleashed in the East came out, you know, so um, I was 13, actually, when the album came out, but I listened mm-hmm. to it later. And this all somehow got me into new wave of British heavy metal and all the German band, German bands like Accept and Judas Priest and, and, and Scorpions, uh, not Judas Priest, but Scorpions and, and Accept for German bands. It's not only the new wave of British heavy metal, so that was basically the metal time of the 80s. And, and that somehow really got me in the end in terms of uh, influence, influences for me as a singer. 
But in the end, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, then uh, Kiski joined Halloween back in the days, and that was the big, uh, big uh, bang here in in in, this, in the metal scene. That listened to this singer, and, and and he's amazing, absolutely. But I was doing my thing earlier already, so um, it's got nothing to do with it, with that anyway. So yeah, that was did, it. Did Halloween ever say, "Oh my God, Ralph is like an incredible singer. Let's let's look to him." I you heard know, that they were ha they were looking for me, but I, I I was still in in my band time pace. And as a young kid, like being 16, 17 years old, starting with music, being with my family, starting my daily job and everything, I, I just was not uh, you know mature enough. Let's say like that. I mean, I was not 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 mature enough to decide those things to move to Hamburg and, and start a career as a musician. You know, but, but was was, was were there any like serious sort of like this guy can friggin' sing. We need I heard him. later, but they never really somehow really asked me. <laughs> uh, you know, it, I just heard that they were interested, and um, Kai was the singer back in the days with Walls of Jericho and so forth. So, so that he also did a great job. He's also a great singer. So, but they were looking for a singer because Kai, you know, as a guitarist and shit, you know, you always want to do concentrate on one instrument and he, he never said he always said to me to myself later he was not considering himself as a singer so that that's the reason why they were looking for one and i heard that they were interested in me as well but that came later you know what about when uh, kiske leaves you know he parts ways with halloween did they go okay let's get that ralph guy no no that was a total different story i was in gallery then already and and I already knew that, and we all knew in the scene that uh, Michael um, was interested in having Andy because they were friends anyway, you know. So that in the end, that was that connection with, with uh, Darius and uh, Michael. Michael. Yeah, I, 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 Michael to me, to me, to me, I gotta tell you, Ralph, you would have been like the perfect fit. Darius is a perfect fit too. Don't get me wrong, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, and we are all once again, we're all happy like it happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. Without without these stories, nothing afterwards would happen anyway, you know. So yeah, that's yeah, all yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. At what point were you in a Judas Priest cover band? Was that like before Gamma Ray or after Gamma Ray? I was after Gamma Ray somehow to prepare myself because I was waiting a long time for, for answers from England. And uh, of course, I wanted to come prepared whenever something happens, which in the end did not. So it, it's quite okay. Like, once again, no, no. <laughs> Tim's great. He's a friend. Uh, yeah. But I mean, was it just a management thing, like management talking to management with Priest? Yes, I was talking to the manager. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. But talking, it was re back in the days, it was emails. Was it emails? No, it was letters. <laughs> Pure letters. later, UPS. Letters and phone calls with a, with a dial phone, you know. <laughs> Did you, and the last question on this, because I know you talk about this all the time, was there like a, like, okay, give us like five songs and that, you know, and, and what were those songs? No, I, I sent demos there for my application anyway, and that was actually Gamma Ray demos and also heading for the East video. So they got that uh, stuff and uh, that might impress them. Okay. And now here we're going to, like we were building up to Primal Fear, right? You know, you start working on this, this music, and which is the first album. Can you tell us about that beginning? Because you said before that there was a time of when metal came down, this never really was in any interest of us because we were we didn't we don't care about any trends but we always composed and did what we felt we love to mm -hmm. do and that's what we still do you know no matter what's going on out there we still love to compose the music we love from the heart and that, that's exactly what happened back in the days we came together 1997 we met tom uh, matt and i because uh, they wanted me to join in a singer album to, as a choir singer. And then we sat together and, and, and talked and they asked, hey, Ralph, uh, we know that's nothing going on with Priest now and you're not in Gamma Ray anymore, so let's write some stuff. And I said, yeah, that's cool because, you know, uh, JBC, the, the company from Japan, was waiting for material anyway for my side. So we, we composed five tracks. It was, I think it was uh, Chain Breaker, it was Dollars, it was Silver and Gold, Nine Lives, four tracks actually and we sent it to japan and got a record deal right away so that was 
pretty simple at the time. And um, it's also very interesting that then after this, uh, the European record companies were hunting us. So it was really great. It was a great position somehow to, to start a band, you know. You know, Germany never, it's sort of like they're metal proof in the 90s with the bands were still sort of going strong where the rest of the world was sort of falling apart on metal, but you guys were cranking it out. There was still that, I mean, did you get that vibe? Like, you know, you know, we're doing what, well, oh, maybe Japan too was an exception, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, like once again, I know that was a crunch time when, when I think the, 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 uh, the West coast stuff, Seattle stuff, uh, music was, uh, na, 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 na. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we didn't care. I mean, once again, we were metalheads and we have this in our blood and that's why we somehow compose music we love. And in the end, when it's honest stuff, people realize that, you know, so we were not just hopping in a trend or whatever, we just did what we love to do. All right. So you start recording the album, you get a deal, a record deal, right? For the first album. Right. And uh, tell me about the next steps there. Yes. Then the record deal was in the pocket with Japan. And then, of course, like I said, there was a fight going on in between European record companies and Marcus Steiger from Nuclear Blast. He was just giving everything to sign us mm -hmm. and, and he, he succeeded in the end, which is a great story as well. So we were happy about that. And, and, and then uh, the first three albums were there and and um, afterwards, there's always they they always uh, somehow uh, pulled pulled the option, and we were all happy that it's going onward like, like that. Yes, and we were <laughs> happy back in the days. A, a step forty eight in the German charts is, was a different number than nowadays. Forty eight might be a little bit of a disappointment nowadays, but back in the days when there were still a lot of album, many albums were sold, it yeah. was a, a quite huge success for us. You know. Kai Hansen, it was at his studio, right? It was recorded there? Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah. The, the, the thing with Gamma Ray was we sorted things out right at three weeks after our split. We had a phone call and everything was fine again. But, you know, st things, things were decided uh, that Kai is going to sing in Gamma Ray and it's not going to happen with me anymore. And that was all fine, you know, but we're, we're still friends. Like nowadays, it's just still fine. We're, we're good buddies. So I invited him and asked him if he wanted to play solo on the album and then that's what he did okay. but i mean it was at his studios right you recorded the whole album at his studios if i remember correctly right yeah absolutely that was the days when we still i think it was still tape machine yeah it was still the first album was i think it was just the first time on a very old hard disc recorder i think but yeah those were the times when the digital era began in the studios as well so I can't remember. I think it was tape or the first big hard disk recorder. <laughs> Probably, yeah, transitional right there, right? Either that, it's digital tape, right? And that was that. That, yeah. That, that was very popular, you know? Um, yeah. <clears throat> Formula One. It's one of my favorite songs off the album. All right. Are you a big car, a car fanatic? Is that what it's all about? I was one of the biggest Michael Schumacher fan back in the days when he was uh, winning one championship out, uh, championship after another. I think it was the first, uh, I think it was still a Benetton. No, I think, was he in Ferrari already? I think he was in Ferrari already. And uh, I just came up with the idea of doing something about Formula One. And I actually, I, I, I bought magazines for Formula One and there was the CD inside with the sounds of the V12 Ferrari. And that's exactly what, what is on the song. The beginning is <laughs> that's, a, that's a B12 engine from a Ferrari a Formula One car. So that yeah, was a little bit of a brave thing to do, but I think it's quite fine. <laughs> well, here in Montreal, we have the Formula One every year. Yeah. So, you know, Jacques Villeneuve is from here and, uh, yes, you know, well, now yeah. with, yes. with, you know, yeah. Um, what other songs like, you know, that you're really proud of from the first album that, you know, this is, you know, yeah, I mean, Nine Lives, the, you open the chain breaker, Tears of Rage, the ballad, which is also somehow uh, extraordinary back in the days with the with the synth uh, intro and everything. So if dollars dollars were dirt, it's raw rock and roll music. And I think that's, uh, yeah, it's honest music. Like I said, it's exactly what we've done on the demo already, which is recorded mm -hmm. in, a, in a proper studio. Uh, nine lives is that sort of your nod to uh, the uh, Kai Hansen Halloween era um, 
not even i think it's even uh, it's i think that's an idea of matt and uh yeah it is a, a song idea from mad and and we, we work together like everything but uh everybody is always invited to have ideas and still and back in the days uh we just brought stuff together and and, and in the end uh yeah it's my uh, boy uh, by, by the way how's matt sinner's health is it better uh how's he's, he doing he's on a good path okay good 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 um have you guys are tossing out ideas for the next album yes many everybody's okay. like like crazy so this the next step is going to be decided to what's going to happen okay all right i'm not i guess you can't reveal too much yet right oh no, not at the moment okay all right what about uh you know so for me the first album has always been a sort of a crossover between priest and halloween right or gamma ray we could say right okay. i mean over the years do you find that people have said that as well yes i mean Many times we heard this is the album what Priest supposed to record after painkilling and shit. You know, it's always this comparison. I mean, there's always there, of course, because yes, I mean, you know, if you sell, if you listen to classic music, it's similar sounds also. So it's the similarity is always there somehow. And of course, people always label my singing to Rob singing, and uh, which is uh, an honor on one hand, you know, but uh, on the other hand, it can also somehow be be somehow. Um, well typecasting we call it yeah in the end somehow it's also why do you always compare me am i my own voice and, and and i mean you can listen to the songs it's totally different to priest uh here and there of course there's rudimental priest stuff as well like that could be in judas priest as well but primal fear is primal fear you know what i always love speed king off the album like the way oh, you yes, sing that's it the, that's the great cover yeah i'm i'm, I'm getting you I'm, I'm reminding you about the album here as we speak thank you, thank you. <laughs> i got it behind there so i should maybe should should look to the song list as well <laughs> <laughs> but speaking i mean is that one of the like is ian gillen one of your you know your influences over the year the way he kind of uses his head voice his falsetto Absolutely. there and that's the era before Halford. And, and I mean, that's the rubber plant era, you know? Yeah. And he they started with the belting already. So uh, with the head voice belting. Yes, I mean, Gil and Ian, I mean, I met him and we were uh, in Rockmeets Classic. He was a guest twice and I was a choir singer being a fanboy back there, of course. <laughs> yeah. I, I, f I find the greatest uh, vocalists, the most technical vocalists are when they go from their chest voice to the head voice and it's flawless. Like you, you can't even tell sometimes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and, and I think that's the case with you. I mean, I can't tell if you were born a baritone or a tenor. I, I you know, I, I just can't tell. I mean, yeah. what were you born? Were you born a baritone and you sort of, I think I'm a tenor. Okay. A natural tenor. You do tend to have that higher pitch on your chest. Yeah. 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 Yes. And, uh, who are your favorite vocalists and, and, and why? Dio Halford Tate. Dickinson, yeah, plan back in the days, Gillen. Yeah, exactly the reason why you said because they can, they all all of them can use the bat, the the chest voice and the head voice, without really uh, now as a vocal teacher I know which register they use when they sing, but back in the days it was just uh, it sounded the same to me like just like for you now so, so that's why I really really uh, somehow appreciate very much you know it's. Uh, it's, it's amazing. What they do. Te do, you think, do you think Pratt and Plant is, from your expertise, Plant a baritone or a tenor, naturally? I think it's a tenor. Yeah. 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 You just tends to always flip into that head voice, uh, voice a lot easier. Like, yeah. Uh, like, he was, uh, yeah. He was pretty much, ah, did I? It's always a zero that's yeah that's the belting head voice <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but he, you know he doesn't doesn't like push his chest voice in the higher notes you know he just kind of just eases into that sort of higher so okay. tell me about your teaching your teaching do you only teach heavy metal or uh what other well you know the rudimental stuff is always the classical background i mean that's the first steps we do in our lessons to learn breathing to learn exactly just what we said to to somehow distinguish the registers somehow where they're located and the different singers always there's a different key where, where the flip is you know where mm -hmm. the switch to the head voice uh begins and that's what we somehow find out first together. And then I get a, a lot of hints of, um, of um, you know, man maintenance of the vocals, which is pretty important for us as vocal, as, as metal singer, we're, because we're really uh, screaming and we're a little bit more louder than pop musicians. So that's uh, pretty much 
built on maintenance and uh and you're, and you're still doing that right you're still a teaching right on a on a daily basis or weekly basis right yes, that's I'm your... also teaching a music school i have uh, kids like from starting from nine to 16 18 19 and uh yeah that's pretty 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 well also for me so i always give myself a new impression those kids are really learning fast and you can really tell that they're they are listening and and and, and the ears are really teaching you a lot already. You learn so much from hearing that um, it's a good thing. Yeah, that's exactly what happened to us back in the 80s when we listened to bands like uh, Saxon and Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and Scorpions and so forth. If you listen to much stuff and you are, you're, um, you, you somehow, you're talented in music, you can really adapt uh, quick. You know what, what do you think about death metal vocals? Like to me as, as, as a, I probably were the same age more or less. Yeah, it's an interesting technique, but it uh, doesn't suit me at all. And and whenever I try, I'm hoarse right away. So <laughs> I know I could also learn the technique, but I don't want to somehow. Maybe some sometimes I use a little bit of, of an effect in the background, doing ah, those kind of stuff. It's actually it's the false vocal cords doing that technique. So, but I don't consider myself as a growl. Is it like a discredit to vocalists? Like, it's kind of like back in the day, punk, okay? The yeah. reason why punks sang, because they couldn't sing, so they just yelled, right? Is it not yes, the same I, thing? I don't think it's a discredit because it's it's a certain technique. Hmm. And you, it's not, no, that not everybody can do it. So, you know, in the end, it's not a discredit if somebody can do it. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, tell me about, I guess, last question is the legacy of the first album, since that's what we're talking about. What has been the legacy of the album over the years? That we're still playing songs live and people still asking for songs uh, from the first album, which is, uh, which is a sign again that uh, they liked it and, and, and uh, we, we can be proud of that album and, and we still play songs live, like I said, Chainbreaker and so forth. So uh yeah, uh, it's pretty much right a, like a red line. There's always one or two songs on, on on the later albums, which also could easily fit on the first one. Was was the first one sort of like the blueprint to the rest of the career? Kind of like that's who we are. Is. And yeah, yes, I think we somehow set our style back in the days. And of course, you always have albums where you try out different things because you don't want to just step on one spot all the time. You just want to also somehow learn and explore without somehow losing uh, contact to what you started from and without somehow being dishonest. Because like, like I only can re repeat myself, whatever we do, we do honest. And uh, when, when we re release something, we are 100% 100 behind what we release. And I guess I should ask you one last question. Your favorite band touring with over the years, you know, wow, we toured with these guys. I can't believe it. Oh, I, for me, as a, as a adorer, it was Halford. When we did the Halford gigs in, in America, I think it was the Metal Gods uh, tour, which uh, somehow they had to stop, <laughs> unfortunately. But that was somehow a great experience for me, ever, seeing my idol every night. Did delivery. Rob say, wait a second, you kind of sound like me. Did he ever, <laughs> did he ever say, goods, you know, delivering the goods every evening? <laughs> you know what? Halford's a great guy, you know, and uh, he's always supportive of all metal musicians. I'm Absolutely. sure you had a, I'm sure you had a great time with him. Absolutely. You know? A gentleman yeah. and a really nice guy. Yeah. All right. On that note, everybody on July, I'm trying to see here the day, July 15th, the uh, re-release of remastered with bonus tracks of, uh, you know, the Primal Fear debut album, which is a classic today, you know? And uh, Ralph, if there's anything you want to say as a last note, promote. Yes, I mean, of course, we are all grateful for all those years the fans gave us as well. I mean, it's a give and take, you know? So I now always say I consider the whole uh, family as a family because once again, without you, we would be nothing. And and, and uh, without us, maybe you. Without me personally, or just in the fans yeah, in general. <laughs> Everybody personally. So I yeah, I'm just kidding, Ralph. That's the sense yeah, of humor yeah, I have. But you, we don't know it's a give and take, and, and it's just uh, well, when whenever we we were in the lockdown, we were missing the the, the time, and then we still miss the time to go out there live. But be sure we will be back, and uh, so we're all looking forward. We look forward to seeing you on tour and uh, in your new album, whenever it comes out, we look forward to that too. Thank you so much. 
Thanks too, Jimmy. So have a wonderful evening.